Hello there and welcome to this discussion on the development of power skills. My name's Adam, I am a member of the Future Leaders Steering Group and I'm welcomed here today with Alex Burbridge, Managing Director of Pro Safety Management. As a group, as a Future Leaders, we need to think about our power skills and we really need to understand what it is that we need to do to help ourselves in our roles, but also as leaders as well. As mentioned, today's is about leadership, so I'm really pleased to welcome Alex. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more? Yeah, I'm uh, Alex Burbage. I've been in health and safety around about 20 plus years. Um, I started just like you, you know, I, I started from really ground zero, um, new into the industry. I did a degree at Nottingham and Trent University, but you could have done an EBOSH or, or any other way of getting into the industry in terms of technical qualification. And then I just literally tried to get myself up that ladder as fast as I can. That's brilliant. That's really interesting. I think we'll resonate with quite a lot of future leaders, actually, about how do we start at the bottom when we've got a qualification or thinking about that key qualification. Um, so not focusing too much on the technical skills, but thinking about those leadership skills that we, we are trying to develop. And what are the key skills that an OSH leader needs to have and why? I think, um, first of all, I would say definitely you just touched on a really good point there. Technical skills. But I would also say you need the a, a 10,000 hour test on your technical skills because you could say, I've got a NEBOSH, I've got IASH, I've got all these things. But actually the application of advising and coaching and supporting a business to actually meet the technical requirements of a job means that you've really got to spend at least 10,000 hours, for example, on risk assessment. So my view is because I used to be a car mechanic years ago. So I would be working in a workshop having to follow something and I'd be like, oh God, this is quite hard work. Can I just do it a simpler way? And really I've got, I had experience from the age of 16 to actually understand how processes in workshops worked and how they didn't work. So if you haven't got that, you can't chat with the men and women of today that are working and you haven't spent time writing risk assessments and saying, do they work? And, and and actually just getting that base level of knowledge. I think it's then really, really hard, although you've got your technical aspect, but the technical skills to apply it, you should really be focusing on that initially and spend a lot of time. It's a bit like a salesperson going in and trying to sell, I don't know, mobile phones in a shop. You're not going to do it, get it right every time, but after 10,000 hours, you can be amazing at just selling mobile phones. But if you have, if you've never actually done a risk assessment yourself, and you've just done the course, you should do ten thousand hours just on writing risk assessments with the engineering teams or whatever industry you're in, and then you'd be amazing just at that, and then you can move on to the softer skills. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's something that quite often comes up as a bit of a debate, really, for a lot of those uh, thinking about becoming you know, or career changing into the OSH profession, that it's, it's, it's that fine line between that you might have some skills, but you might also have that technical knowledge or experience, but which ones are more important and which ones you should do sort of first. Um, and it's great that you're using sort of like the 10,000 hours analogy as well, because I think it gives a bit of context to that. It's not overnight. Don't expect no, that next not. week you're going to be brilliant at doing that. You, you do need to spend a lot of time and sort of dedicate it and sort of focus and sort of, you know, hone in on those skills rather than sort of going, well, I'm half good at it. So, you know, therefore, yeah, I'll, I'll don't, be brilliant at it. Don't, don't do that. So I always say here, do the boring stuff really well. Like do the boring stuff really, really well. And you're super good at it. And then you'll get that respect because if you don't do the boring stuff or you think it's boring, some people love risk assessment and some people say, oh, it's really boring. But if it takes grind and grit to do it and you're really good at that, everyone will come to you and then you'll go, OK, I've, I've conquered that and now I can move on to the next bit with confidence that, you know, you've got you've just got that in your back pocket, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, that comes back to imposter syndrome and that sort of feeling of, well, I can't challenge because I don't have that. But from what you're saying, obviously, the time dedication, it'll enable you to to be a much stronger leader because you have got that experience. But I, also what you've mentioned there about actually understanding from their perspective and actually seeing it in the reality, I guess, also yeah. makes you a great leader. Yeah. You've, you, you, uh, it's when um, at the moment, because I'm, I'm running project safety management and we're just writing some copy for a new e-learning course. 
and I've got this guy who has sold, I think, around about £70 million worth of products across his lifetime. And he is around about 70. He's, he's giving me some advice, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm understanding how to write. If anyone doesn't know what copy means, it basically means when you read a magazine, some of that is copy on the front, like how you get someone to buy something. So the marketing copy, the, the, the text, you know, says like, you know, um, lose weight now in 30 days, that's marketing copy. So this guy is advising me how to write copy. And what he said was, when, you're, when you've got this course that you're developing, you've got to understand that they understand that you've been in the trenches as well. You could go into a bar, into a cafe and talk to someone about your experience that means that person's going to relate to you more. If you can do that as an Irish professional and say, I've been in the trenches, I know this risk assessment, this problem here, this, this, you know, you get that rapport straight away. And I think that's what I've learned is like, you've got to do this stuff that you might find, oh, I just want to be this next leader. I want to be the next you know, head of safety at such and such or director. You've got to do this bit first to really hone it. And that's great. That's really interesting. So just thinking about those or uh, um peers or those who are sort of more junior in the profession so what else can they do to to focus on to become that leader well to become a leader um i i believe it's based on skill so skills you effectively everyone has to start with the technical bit we've just talked about that but then it's those communication skills those influencing skills and but skill effectively starts off with information. So um, the number one skill, um, sorry, the number one um, place to get information from is internet. It's totally free. You can go on there and you can go on generally YouTube and you'll find every single skill that you want to learn on YouTube. And effectively, information comes into your brain. You then apply it through experience and then you get feedback. Now, the bit that we don't get very, very well in IOSH professionals is because generally you're a lone wolf. Most of us are. And or we're in situations where you're remote from other professionals in your business. So for example, if there's, I don't know, 30 health and safety professionals in a business, it's quite rare, but say if there was, you'd all be remote generally. And so you need to find someone, either a mentor or a coach, that once you apply something, you get feedback, then you apply it again and get feedback, apply it again. So you're always, you're applying the information constantly and then you're getting a review and someone saying yes or no, that looks right. That, 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 that someone is above you. So you're here and they're there. And the whole idea, it doesn't matter what skill you're trying to get, if it's public speaking, is it um, written, your written and formal uh, writing of processes is, is, is correct, or if it's understanding management systems, or is it raising um, a business case, is it um, managing a team, you need someone to go from here to here, the quickest way is through a coach, or someone in an informal relationship with someone, and basically as you pour information, that, that person up there is pouring information into you, into your brain, and looking at what you're doing, that's going to supercharge you. If I'd known that 20 years ago, I would be paying for coaches. I would empty my bank account. I'd literally go, I don't want any money in, the, in my bank account. Because as Warren Buffett says, the quickest way to get from here to here and recession-proof you is through skill development. And that is through applied learning and great feedback from people that are higher than you. Yeah, and that's brilliant because obviously with IOSH and anybody as a future leader, they can obviously look at using the mentoring platform to, to find somebody yeah, in their own or very similar or even a different um, sort of sector so that they can actually apply and do that kind of learning sort of stuff. And it's interesting really when you sort of say about the feedback and sort of review, it's, it's coming back to a typical management system of plan, do, check, act. It is, yeah. We, yeah. we don't necessarily <laughs> Adam, apply yeah. to ourselves. Yeah, so uh, so it's great. That's really good at feedback and advice in itself, actually. So obviously recommend anybody who think about getting a mentor um, through IOSH, obviously, um, or you know, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm sure there's plenty of people uh, and, who would be able to assist as well. And, and the key thing for this is don't just get one mentor or coach, get loads. Get like, if you're struggling with impact in certain area and that's why i always say i think we've talked about it before but basically sales 
marketing, um, some level of operation. So someone that's in an operational role, um, you know, you, you know, product development. So I think the first one is try and sell yourself a bit better as a nice professional, understand the sales process, understand how the company makes their first sale. Because actually with company, any business you're in, it would have been started by either one person or maybe 10 people, right? They would come together and they'd have made their first sale. So the, how did they make that first sale? When did it start? And then once they sell something, they might not have built the product fully. They've kind of built half built products. Then this product is then developed over time and it gets better and better. It's a bit like the iPhone. It has iteration, iteration, and it's sold again and it's sold again. I ask prof sorry, professionals in, in the health and safety arena don't get enough chance or time to look at the sales process. I think I would always start the sales process because that's how the company still exists. So you understand sales, you understand the product development, and then you start looking at all the other support services around that, like the maintenance side and things like that. And once you've built up an idea framework from the initial sale all the way through the business, you can go into any meeting at any time and blow them away because they were like, wow, like you understand how we're making business. You won't understand how net profit, what's our net profit on our product lines. Then look at our gross profit. You know, you can start eloquently talking about the whole thing. Absolutely. And so obviously that's a great way of then extra demonstration of the leadership skills. Um, but if you're in a company where it's quite difficult, maybe potentially to, to sort of do that, how yeah. how could someone develop those skills um, and sort of, you know, grow as that kind of leader? Well, you can't, you don't, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sometimes we're really siloed and also we fear, um, we fear making mistakes. So we fear asking um, and we worry that we've been brought in to do this job. So if we suddenly go, oh, I really want to go over here and learn about sales, I want to know about that, it's going to get shut down. So again, um, there's a really cool book called Seven Figures in Seven Years, and it's by Michael Masterson. I think it's an unbelievable book. So it talks about a person in a business that just comes to work, and they're a good performer. So you could be a safety professional early doors you're just a good performer you're not quite sure if it's the right career for you or it might be yeah absolutely for me but what you do is you sit there siloed but really what you want to doing is coming in and making a lot of noise you want to be saying i want more not as in i want more work to do but i want to know more and kind of finding someone in the business that's going to give you a chance and that person will go okay i'm going to give you a chance and I'm going to allow you to spend time with me. And that might be just an hour a week. And you just spend time with them, just like it might be at a lunchtime or something like that. And then next minute, and it starts to grow, you know, and grow and grow and grow that relationship. But that person's got to be up here. Okay. And, and then, you know, you, you get that chance. If you just come to work and you expect it to happen, it will not happen. And all the people I know who I've got to that senior level, I've got this hunger so my hunger comes from the fact is I don't think I'm good enough. I'm not good enough. Why? It comes from my childhood. Like there's a thing inside me. I want to be better. I want to be better. I want to be, I don't want to be better than anyone else. Cause it's not less comfort. It's not like, um, you know, maybe when I was younger, like I want a better car or a better house. And so like, that's not what drives me now. It's like, I want to be better because I feel I can make, an impact on other people's lives and what i want to show that i can do that and that's a lot through training and giving ideas and inf you know helping people grow and i've got a real passion to help people i left school with no qualifications at all failed school so i i want to show that you can learn in a different way and if you've got that fire in your belly and you want to do that then you can do anything it's just that drive but you'll fail a lot some people won't give you their time but don't worry there'll be someone that will give you their time and that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think that's really, you know, a great point to finish on there, Alex, as well, in terms of that actual, you know, don't take it as defeat, don't take it as, you know, this is the end. It's just about that understanding where, who else or where else you can find that. And I think the other point you've mentioned there, which um, I know has been discussed by future leaders before as well, is that why and actually what is your why and your purpose? And with that, that should actually lead you on quite nicely as well. So that's really great um, information and tips, to be honest, Alex. That's really, really helpful. 
Um, another question is, so as you're moving through different sort of roles, and obviously as an OSH professional, we do start often as an officer or an advisor. Yeah. However, when you come to become a manager and thinking about maybe some larger organizations where it's a it's a large safety team rather than sort of lone wolves and individuals, how do you transition from becoming a team member and then using all those skills to then being a leader of a team? Yeah. It, it, it is a really interesting transition. I don't think we're given the opportunity young enough in our careers. I, I, I think we, you know, I think I was, don't quote me on this, but I might have been about 35 when I was head of safety. Yeah, probably about that at O2. I, I started off with just two um, two managers, two health and safety managers, and they managed themselves. They were older guys, they were older than me. They, they knew what they were doing. They were getting paid an awful lot of money. Um, you know, these guys were on decent, decent wages in O2. And O2 is, you know, pay, which to pay pretty well. And so I, I was almost, I think it was difficult in some respects because I was feeling that I really want to manage a team, not just two professionals who are very seasoned. But I think as you, the transition, I think, you know, I, I don't think it's good to be, chucked in the deep end in terms of just going out there and managing a team I think it has to be slowly developed by you doing you know projects initially a bit like university or college or whatever where you might run a t run a project so you get that you get that experience of running the project so you're virtually we call it virtually managing I and mean, virtually managing means kind of calls like this but it used to be years ago it's like <clears throat> you had got a dotted line into you you know um <clears throat> excuse me they um it's a little drink It would be normally you'd get them seconded to you about half a day or two days a week, and then you would you would manage a project. I mean, it's really really good to hone your skills and then get feedback on that and how you did. I think good coaching. Obviously, we've talked about coaching. You want someone senior that's great at managing people that you um, uh, aspire to. I read a lot of books on management, and I mean, I went through. Jack Welsh was an amazing. I mean, I think he's died now, but. Um, from GE, really, really good. He's, some of his books is like, uh, I think he has the, the d different rules of managing people. I think also understand who you are. So there's a thing called DISC, which talks about dominance, influence, um, I think support and compliance. Like what kind of person are you? Understand who you are. Some people aren't great at managing people. Don't be a manager if, you're, if, you, if you aren't a influencer and probably someone that's really supportive but you're more compliance and you know you have to have a bit of dominance potentially to be a bit of a leader but I'm, I'm not saying you definitely have to have it but I'm saying that if you're compliance and you're you know you're not you're not a great communicator in that way but you're great at something else then go and do that don't try and be a manager if really it's a, a round um, peg in a square hole like it just don't do it like it will hurt it will physically hurt like I'm running this business here but there's people in this business are far better at process and probably time management than I am. I'm more an I, which is like an influencer, but I love people. So I want to support them. But that's not to say I'm great at process and HR stuff. So, you know, you, you, you've got to look at who you are and then go and go and grab those opportunities. But then as you develop, so I had a team of around about 15 and they weren't all safety professionals. And then I had an extended team of contractors working on security projects for O2. And I would say that generally I developed and evolved as a, as a manager and a leader over like a two year period. Initially, I, was, I wasn't bad at trust, but I was worried what people are doing. And in the end, I became much more trusting as I got to know them. So really know who you are, know your team, and everyone in your team, you kind of take a risk with. So you kind of like everyone, one person might be great remote working, but other and, and be self kind of like they have their own abilities just to get on and deliver. Then someone else might really be task related. I need this. I need that. And you have to actually spoon feed them. But that's their style. They like that. And they like loads of feedback. So just get to know them. That move your style, um, understand yourself, get on again on YouTube, look at great leaders. And just apply your own style and you will make mistakes 
um, you might actually, I mean, the most difficult thing is actually to um, make some redundant or unfortunately put them through a um, performance improvement plan. But you'll learn loads about that. that. Just doing that alone will make you a better leader, but just reflect on how you are with people. No, that's that's really helpful, Alex. And I think it it's right in terms of also not being afraid to, to actually walk away from a role potentially if it's not quite right and it doesn't actually suit your skills. And again, through that reflection, you may find something which actually does suit you better for for what it is that you enjoy, but also then what you can like support others with potentially as well. Um I have got a question then. So as a leader, can you be a leader and a doer at the same time? That's a very, very, very good question. I think doing is, I mean, if you're running a business, so let's not talk about safety professionals because I think we all know the doing bit. So if you have too many things going on at one time, then effectively, I mean, it's a bit like Elon Musk. So Elon Musk got Twitter, Tesla, SpaceX. Okay. I mean, he's a phenomenal guy and people go, okay, he can, he can run all those businesses and focus on them all equally. And they will all grow because all he's got investors in there. So he's borrowed all this money and, he, and they're going to grow. Right. But actually he might be a one in a billion person that can do that. We're not all like Elon Musk. So what we have to do is go, okay, where am I proportioning my time up? I've still got to do some doing. I've still got to look at the pay. I've still, I've still got to advise customers. I've still got to do all these other things, right? So there's some stuff that I have to have to do. But then as a leader on the influencing side, um, if, you're, if you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're, a, you know, you're a conductor, you're a conductor in a, of a band, you will stand at the front conducting, okay? But I still think there'll be times when you've got to do doing because you've still got to apply your knowledge and support others and go down into the detail. Because as a leader, you've got to go down into detail every now and again to check that everyone, because you're accountable at the top, and really you're allowing accountability to flow down into responsibility of the people down below. You're saying, okay, you're responsible for that, but it was my, is my accountability, if you see what I'm saying. So you've got to kind of go down. And I think every now and again, get your hands dirty and see, I mean, some of the best programs on TV is like Undercover Millionaire or Undercover Boss. And what they learn from doing the do is phenomenal. Like, why would you, you know, just be at the ivory tower and not understand but i think the influencing skills that you need particularly at your peer level so it, it, you basically we would be managing down be managing up or above you you'll be managing across and then you'll be managing outside your organization so influencing outside your organization so you do have to spend a lot of time on those skills those stakeholder skills but you do have to every now and again, it might be the 80-20 rule. Let's just put it that way. That's a simple one to remember. 80-20. 20% doing, 80% influencing. See how you get on. You might need to change the, um, you know, depending on business and the pressures, you might need to change that around a bit. Yeah, that was really, really um, helpful, Alex. Again, I think it is right in terms of that. We need to understand you know, what is happening on the ground to then influence and help with that stakeholder engagement as well. Because obviously they're very similar. They'll be having to, to think about what's on the ground as well as above and things as well. So very true. Um, and just the last question that we've got. So how does good leadership influence behaviour and culture? I think, again, just similar to the last question. Elon Musk did it last week. He said, you're either out because you're not going to do the hours and you're not amazing. And, you know, he's got a lot of people leaving Twitter. So, you know, and that's in the news. That's not just me making it up. So the influence of leadership is like, that is a perfect example. If I did that in this business, I think people would leave here. And I don't want to do that because everyone has a unique skill. And what you've got to do is you've got to find that unique skill that makes that person come to work and, and make them feel valued. And that's what a good leader would do. But there's people that need managing at the organization and need to leave 100%. You know, this is going back to Jack Welsh and some of the other books I've read, you know, like, yeah, some people don't fit and actually their skills are much, much better elsewhere. 
but in terms of my behaviors what i look like on linkedin what i say on linkedin what i what what i say when i come in the office you know when i there's two guys in the office right now and i'll come in How, how's your weekend johnny you know dean dean's just had his birthday you know we're going to go out for a bit of something to eat later you know i, I want to know what their days are like i want to know what they're you know they're struggling on at work and and, and reaching out all the time don't just think you can be a hard-nosed leader and be a real dominant character just because you've got to the next level. I remember the day that I got head of safety O2, I walked in and people started laughing at my jokes that never laughed at them before. My jokes are terrible. And they treated me differently just because I was more of a senior leader. And I was like, that's not, that's not what I'm going to be like. I'm not going to certainly strut around peacocking it. I'm going to actually be exactly the same, be grounded, and I'm actually just going to be, you know, authentic in um, who I am. I mean, I think Elon Musk is authentic, but, you know, there's certain ways of doing things. And uh, whether you want your workforce to stay or not, I think he's done it on purpose. So he can actually <laughs> create a mass cull and then keep the people he really wants to keep. So, yeah, I don't know if that's answered your question, but. No, and absolutely. And I think what you've um, mentioned there again about authenticity and actually um, being able to, to sort of show your principles and actual your own behaviours, that has a mass effect on, on a, which is really helpful, hopefully, for other future leaders to, to actually respond to. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time, Alex, today. It has been really appreciated, and I'm sure a lot of the members of the Future Leader community will actually be thankful for your answers today to help them grow as future leaders. Um, if there's any other things that any future leaders should consider, where do you think they should find out more information? Well, that's a good question, Adam. Um, I think they should write down on a piece of paper all the areas to take half an hour of your time away from your family, your work, and just, just go to a coffee shop and just write down every single thing that you feel you need to work on, both from your personal life and your work life, because they're the same, they merge together. And, and then go on the internet and go on YouTube or anywhere and just type in how you improve. How can I improve this? How can I improve that? Don't just go for a formal course. Don't try and do a degree in psychology. Don't try and do that. Don't do all any of that. Don't spend any money because you know, universities are businesses. They just want you to, they'll write their copy. So it sounds amazing. Come and do this and it'll solve all your problems. You can solve your own problems. The internet is free. That's where you should first start with. And then after that, once you've, you've typed in, okay, this is the solution to this problem I might have at work or whatever it is, and then move forward with, with that. You know, obviously IOSH is a great resource. You can look at that, but just expand your horizons using the internet because that's what it's there for really, not for social media. It's for you to learn and, and, and get free information. Thank you again, Alex. Your time has been um, absolutely incredible. And thank you again for, for coming along for this discussion. No worries. Thank you. For, thanks for having me.